This is infuriating, guys. Can you hear me now? Does it work now? Hello? Yes! Okay. All right. Well, there was a button that was yellow before, and I unyellowed it because I thought that meant off. Never mind. Why do you guys care? Thanks for coming to Sound Booth Theater Live to watch me struggle with tech once again. Um, that's basically what the show is all about. Uh, it's about me not actually knowing how to use my equipment. And it's not supposed to be just on one side, but I don't know what to do about it. You know, I updated Wirecast, and it went from version 7 to 8. And I guess 7 to 8 is a downgrade, but they didn't tell me that until, uh, I mean, it, I, I had to pay for it too, so lucky me. <laughs> I can't get your guys' chat to work on my iPad. Today's especially bad. Especially bad day. Got it started so bad. And I can't even get, the, I can't even get stereo sound going for whatever reason. It looks like left and right are on. Maybe it needs to be set to mono, though. I don't know how to do that. How about that? Oh, there we go. That probably helped, didn't it? <sighs> I shouldn't have updated. You don't update things that you don't even understand in the first place, I think, is the way it should work. Still just on one side? Really? Oh, yeah. What? How's that? Nope. That's all to one side. Oh, I think you have to purchase a higher version of Wirecast to get stereo sound. What? <laughs> Guys, this is such a terrible start. Today's just not a good day for me. I don't know what it is. Okay, but maybe these... Uh... Maybe these requests will cheer me up. Uh, so first of all... We got the votes in. Um, you guys voted overwhelmingly for a certain uh, a certain novel that didn't appear in the in the in the waiting screen at the beginning. This one appeared though, The Luckless, uh, by A. M. Soma. I believe it's Soma. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but I hope so. Um, and this was a this was actually a fresh request. I think maybe not even a week ago it got requested, and people really wanted to see it. So that's coming up. Finally, Hell's Glitch gets uh, gets some attention. Um, wait, it didn't come up, did I? Did it? Ah, shit. What is wrong with me today? Okay. So Hell's Glitch is coming up right after that. Uh, finally, that one gets some. What's it say? Mono sounds like... Sorry, guys. I'm trying so hard today to get... I can't connect to chat on my iPad for some reason. Um, maybe it's on the wrong Wi-Fi. Dear Lord. Don't push any more buttons. Uh... Yeah, it's on the wrong Wi-Fi is what it is. Come on, guys. I'm, I'm saying guys as in my iPad. What? Okay, so Hell's Glitch is going to be second, and then the infamous Hugo Award-nominated Space Raptor Butt Invasion will be the third request for today. And, uh... Spoiler alert, it's NSA it's NSFW as fuck. So 
If you guys are sensitive at all, if you have kids around, in about an hour I'm starting Space Raptor Butt Invasion, and it's probably exactly what it sounds like. So, be prepared for that. Be prepared to shut it off if you want to. Be prepared to invite the extra people that you think would actually be more interested in the show if it was this kind of crazy shit. Um, do what you gotta do when this is coming around, because Space Raptor Butt Invasion... I mean, it was like an invasion when I think Michael Ryan Soilo posted it, because as soon as he posted it and requested it, everyone's like, yes! It, it felt like an invasion. I don't know if it felt like a butt invasion. I've never been invaded in the butt, but you guys overwhelmingly wanted to see this. <laughs> uh, so, I don't, bl- I don't blame you. I bet it's hilarious. For me, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, but the people have spoken, um, so I'll do it, I guess. But on to Retha, and for anyone else, any of the any of you authors who who uh, requested this, requested your stuff with Space Raptor Butt Invasion, just know, <laughs> just know that it's that it's going to be at the end of the show. So you can tell your your you know whoever you invited to come here to peace out if they want to as well. Yeah, another Chuck Tingle. Yep, that's correct. So the Luckless. Um, as far as I can tell, this is uh, this is lit RPG, and it's like uh, YA lit RPG. Am I right about that? Does anyone else know anything about this particular series? Looks like I'll be reading chapter thirteen. No, it's not first. I always put the cringe theater stuff at the end, so that anyone who wants to peace out can peace out. All right, Twitch on my iPad, why are you not working? All right, so she gave me character descriptions. This is awesome. I love getting character notes. Kit. Female, mid-twenties, main character. Jaded but long-suffering. Kit's character is useless in a fight, but she's excellent at party tactics, so she is the reluctant party leader. She's quite expressive and normally swears a lot, but the game will mute you if you use real cuss words, so she says a lot of substitutes. Shut the front door instead of shut the fuck up, for instance. Class, dancer. Support class. She's often mentally at odds with her character class and build, and is using and is used to playing a high DPS mage class rather than the support class she is stuck on. Physique, she's an elf, though she doesn't like it, so she's the tallest of the party and has a very elegant build which she has a hard time adjusting to. Okay. Oh, Ian wants a free audiobook, so he's getting one. By the way, we got four left. We got, we, I usually give away five every show, so Ian's got one. Prowl. Male, mid-twenties. <coughs> even my... Even this technical stuff isn't working right. I just coughed on some water. Hey, all right. My chat's working on my iPad now. Uh, come on. All right, Prowl, male, mid-twenties, sarcastic, quippy, and smart-talking. He uses pointed quips a lot to communicate or underline a person's shortfalls, but he'll jump straight into a fight if someone is in trouble or needs help. Class Saboteur, rogue class. Physique, tall and slim, more of a slender rogue build. His armor has more buckles than it should, and he wears a pair of goggles on his forehead for fashion purposes only. Okay. Uh, Rico, female, mid-thirties. Okay, and this isn't like like R I C O, it's R I K O, so it's more like a Japanese name, Rico. Expressive, oh, competent, expressive, and the party's elect spokesperson whenever they chat with NPCs as she's a smooth talker. Excuse me. She can be cheeky, but she's very friendly and knowledgeable about the gaming world they're stuck in. She's a druid, medium height, thicker build. Built like a female rugby player, always dressed in druid robes. Okay, Cookie, another female, age 20, endlessly cheerful, fun-loving, easily excitable. Her sunshine outlook is at odds with her cutthroat character class, which she plays really well. Night Stalker, another rogue. Shorter, slim, pixie-like build, though she's cute-looking, she wears all black for her character class. 
Okay. Three females, one male. Another female. Uh, Vic slash Victoria. Age, female, age 20. Generally a little more on the grumpy side, which she uses to cover up her inner marshmallow. She is a total video game noob who never wanted to play, but got dragged into it via, co- via cookie. Class wizard. Built like a female basketball player. Taller, willowy. Axel slash Axelent. Male, age 16. Youngest member of the party, cocky, always eager to fight, fairly obsessed with showing how cool his character is, but he does work well with the other players and listens to the party commands, mostly. Warrior. Tall, broad-shouldered, typical fighter class build. He sports a man bun and is not afraid to wear mismatched armor if it means he gets better stat bonuses. Gil, mage, male, age 20. The most easy-tempered member of the party. He is always the first to offer help, Super honorable and kind. He stays calm no matter how bad things get, and as a result, is quite good at his tanking role. Okay, so he's another tank. Crusader. Big burly guy. Looks a bit like a wrestler. Oh, uh, what's up, David? And Slim... Slim... Slimki? Slim... Slimki? Slimki? Um... Anyone commenting in Facebook? Nope. Okay. And I need to mute this. Mute my computer. There we go. Muted. Slim Slimikia Slimkiai Slimmy K I don't know how to pronounce your name. Who are you? What do you want from me? Doof. Dude. Okay. Well, I don't know who you are, Slimmy Kia, Kiai, but I'm glad you got you made it too. Alright. So, on to Luckless. The Luckless by A.M. Shoma. Soma. It seems to be doing really well on Kindle as well. Um, maybe you guys have already read this, or I don't know. Slimmy is fine. <laughs> okay. Slimy? Kit's eyes were so narrowed in concentration, they were little slits she could barely see out of as she... They were little slits she could barely see out of as she pressed herself against the caravan wall and slowly waddled along, doing her best to remain in the shadows. Alright, I just gotta review these characters one more time. Axel and Gil are the tanks. Victoria is the noob. So Kit, okay, Kit is our main character. I'll just use... My, uh, my standard female protagonist voice, which I'm very fond of. Um, let's see. And then, oh wait, Prowl is the first person to talk. Sarcastic, quippy, smart talking. You are aware that just because your eyes are closed and you can't see the dragons doesn't mean that they won't be able to see you, right? Prowl drawled quietly. He, like Cookie, had cloaked himself with the shadows and was invisible. Rico must, Rico must have had some kind of Prowl radar, though. When she lashed out with a foot, she connected with Prowl's invisible shins. Ouch! The, ouch! The saboteur, the saboteur hissed. And Rico is the, okay. She's the druid. Where'd you go? Where'd you go? If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <coughs> if you can't if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Rico chastised in a whisper. But then I would never talk, Prowl murmured. A drop of sweat trickled down Kit's back. Would both of you just be quiet? She spoke a little louder than she meant to and one of the five dragons that roamed the cavern, the orange one which was closest to them, turned in their direction. Its eyes glowed in the dim light, and a growl rumbled deep in its throat. Kit bit her tongue and stopped moving. She even stopped breathing. The dragon raised its snout and tasted the air with a flick of its tongue. After what felt like an eternity, it turned away and nosed a pile of gleaming jewels. 
Kit released the puff of air she'd been holding on, holding in. That was frightening, Co Cookie whispered just off Kit's left side. The wall curved inward, and Kit dropped to her knees and scurried along to avoid any more draconian attention. Can either of you see the seal? Prowl, Cookie? I think I see it, Cookie said, or at least where it's being kept. That inlet at the very back of the room? Yeah, I bet Rico's last gold coin that it's in the that it's in that little hovel. Which reminds me, do you think the dwarves would mind if we grabbed some of their extra treasure? Rico whispered as she and Kit skittered past a gold statue. Kit paused momentarily to pull up the collar of her shirt, which was steadily traveling south as she inched along. You already asked that, and there's no way we're risking you making a noise when you start grabbing handfuls of coins. A girl can dream. I'd say you should just... I'd say you should just marry one of the rich dude players, Prowl said, but I don't think any of them would want you. Rico snarled. You mushroom-faced brat! You can get married in Chronicles of Retha? Cookie asked. Kit frowned when she crawled around three stacked treasure chests and came to a huge pile of coins that was as big as a small house. She had seen it from the entrance of the room and thought there was a space between it and the wall. Now she could see it was flush against the cavern. They would either have to climb over it or crawl around it, which would veer them dangerously close to a red dragon, who was curled up like a cat and kneading its claws into two different sets of gold armor. It's not really marriage, per se. Rico used the momentary pause to adjust the hood of her robes. In the game, it's referred to as pledged, which is really just a fancy way of saying engaged. Oh, revered, oh, revered party leader. Are we going to get moving any time soon? Prowl asked. As long as you're invisible. Oh. As long as you're invisible, you are incredibly cocky and absolutely insufferable, Rico whispered. Kit, having made the decision to creep around the pile of gold rather than climb it, as she feared they would as she feared they would loosen some of the coins and send cascades of them falling down, alerting the dragons to their presence, started to army crawl alongside the mini mountain of gold. Retha doesn't o Retha doesn't offer marriage because it wants to minimize the possibility of legal action. There's lots of cases in which couples got married in other games and then eventually separated which made going through their joint character bank accounts and belongings a legal nightmare. With the whole pledged thing, characters never combine belongings, so any kind of breakup is very cut and dry. Oh, Cookie said. That's a fun thing to include. Though Kit couldn't see the red dragon over the piles of treasure, she heard the alarming noise of its claws crushing armor. The creature had to be only a gold stack or two away. Kit pressed herself so close to the floor she was almost slithering around like a snake as she edged along the mountain of gold coins. When she almost reached the safety of the cave wall, she, exha she exhaled with thankfulness and even dared to push herself up onto her hands and knees. She scurried forward about two feet before she scurried forward about two feet before she was blasted with hot sulfur-scented air. A dragon. Kit, barely daring to breathe, glanced over her shoulder. Only Rico was there, blinking curiously at her. Kit? Kit's heart pounded in her throat, and another blast of acidic air hit her. Dread boiled in her stomach, and Kit slowly turned to stare at the pile of gold coins. Barely visible under the show of wealth, a gold dragon snout a gold dragon snout poked out from under the mountain of coins. Kit swallowed her exhale and carefully pointed out the dragon. A sharp intake of breath that came from behind her told Kit Rico saw the beast as well. Together, they slowly crawled away from the pile of money, sweating profusely whenever the creature breathed on them. When they were finally far enough away from the sleeping dragon that Kit could inhale without fear of waking it, Cookie whispered, I'm sorry, I should have scouted ahead and noticed that dragon. That was my feeling. Not at all, Cookie. Not at all, Cookie, Rico said out of a corner of her mouth, 
useless prowl could have found out that much as well. The important thing is, we made it. Kit's heart sputtered as they closed in on the little inlet. They were almost there. We'll just have to make sure we don't go back that way. I'll check, a I'll check ahead and make sure the seal is really here, Prowl said. Kit, Cookie, and Rico were silent as they inched along, weaving their way through priceless treasures in order to reach the seal. When Kit and Rico dared to stand, Prowl threw off his cloak pa Prowl threw off his cloak skill and flickered into view. It's here. He pointed to a rather unassuming burnished gold disc that was the size of a saucer. A couple of runes were carved into its surface. Otherwise, there was nothing remarkable about it. It sat on a little wooden stand on a gold table that was probably far more valuable. Kit swallowed thickly and held her breath as she picked up the seal, which was heavier than she expected. She froze for a moment, waiting for some kind of outcry from the dragons. But nothing happened. A quest certification, however, popped up. I'll do my Patrick Stewart for this. You have obtained the Dwarvish Seal. The Elvish Seal, Human Seal, and Fey Seal remain for you to claim. Okay, so Gil, I have to remind myself who Gil is. Gil is the 20-year-old. Axel is the 16-year-old. All right. Well done, Gil praised over the party channel. We received the notification that you successfully retrieved the seal. We shall continue to wait for you at the, ca at the cavern entrance. Great. Thanks, guys. Kit turned on her heels and peered into the darkness. Cookie? Here. The Night Stalker stepped out of the shadows, revealing herself. Kit passed her the seal. Kit passed her the seal. Remember, if we are attacked, you have to get out. Just keep running, even if the rest of us stop to fight. Do you understand? Cookie gave her a businesslike nod. I'll get this out of the treasure chamber. I swear it. Kit smiled and squeezed her shoulder. Just do your best. Cookie slipped the seal in her inventory, then stepped back into the shadows and disappeared again. With the seal safely stowed, Kit turned her mind to the increasingly difficult task of picking a way to exit the cave. With the, se with the seal safely stowed, Kit turned her mind to the, to the increasingly diff Kit turned her mind to the increasingly difficult task of picking a way to exit the cave. There's no helping it, she said. I think we'll have to edge past the golden dragon again. If we follow the opposite wall, it will put a smack dab in the path of the green dragon, and he roams. Uh, Rico. Don't sweat it, Rico said. We already got past the gold dragon once. As long as we don't stop to tickle his nostrils, I think we will be fine. I think we will be fine. Shut up, Wesley. Shut up. Shut up, Wesley. How's that? Sorry, I interrupted our read for a little for a little Patrick Stewart quote quote. Kit pressed her lips together. I still don't like getting that close to a dragon, but I don't think we have another option. Prowl, having also cloaked his character, spoke somewhere to Rico's left. You could always strut up to a dragon, kick it, get one-shotted, and then respawn back in the city. Once again, your helpfulness is positively astounding, Rico said. It's a legitimate tactic, Prowl said. It is... But quest lines can be tricky, Kit said. There's no way to tell how fussy it is, and if anyone dies, if it... And if anyone dies, if it will still count. So I would at least like to attempt to make it out of the treasure chamber in one piece. The gold dragon it is, Cookie said. Kit nodded again, got... Kit nodded and again got down on her hands and knees with Rico copying her. Together, they inched along the cavern wall, pushing themselves as close to the ground as possible whenever one of the dragons happened to glance in their direction with its glowing eyes. Though the chamber air was cool, sweat glistened on Kit's brow as she edged past the gold dragon's protruding nostril. Glistening, Kit knew, because elf characters, even elves who were, even elves who were disliked by their fellow elves, would never resemble a sweaty pig. What?
I don't understand what that means. Oh, I guess Kit is not an elf? I thought she is an elf. I'm confused, guys. I hate, I hate that, I, okay, so when I try, to, when I'm talking to you, I gotta look at the camera, not up here, because you don't, we don't engage in that way. Up here is where the chat is, so that's why I'm instinctively doing that. Come on, chat thing. Let's go, there we go. Ladies glisten, not sweat. I see. Oh, I get it. Glistening, Kit knew, because elf characters, even elves who were disliked by their fellow elves, would never resemble a sweaty pig. Got it. Got it. She was starting to feel optimistic about their chances of survival after navigating around almost the entire mound of coins that were piled up on top of the sleeping dragon. She could almost reach out and touch the cave wall when there was a scrape of metal being dragged across the ground. It was barely louder. What? She could almost reach out and touch the cave wall when there was a scrape of metal being dragged across the ground. It was barely louder than a pin falling, but all the dragons in the room turned and looked at them. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So they've been like whispering and talking to each other, but barely more, more than a pin drop wakes him up I guess because it's metal I don't know okay Kit turned around to look at Rico who was wide-eyed and clutching a coin in her hands sorry the druid said the previously sleeping but now enraged gold dragon shot out of the gold pile sending coins flying through the air like metallic bits of hail the coins hit Prowl and Cookie, interrupting their cloaking skills and revealing them to the room. Kit scrambled to her feet as the dragon roared with enough force to shake the chamber. Run! she shouted. Cookie, stick to the wall! Rico, Prowl, split up! Kit fought every part of her mind that screamed at her to make a beeline for the exit, and instead, and instead turned sharply to run into the middle of the room. The red dragon swatted at her with its tail, and she barely managed to fling herself out of the way before it crushed her. She immediately rolled to her feet and kept running, making good use of her swear proficient swear prof oh, making good use of her swear proficiently skill when a white dragon s She immediately rolled to her feet and kept running, making good use of her swear proficiency skill when a white dragon spat a ball of lightning at her. Maggots, mobs, and malarkey! I hate dragons! She yelled. The crimson orange dragon swiped a. The crimson orange dragon swiped a claw at her, and it was so close it cut through the puffy fabric of her pants, but only nicked her leg. We have zero luck, zero. This is all Rico's fault, with her greed and lack of self-control. Prowl jumped onto a dragon's back and slid down its side. The dragons are just following their ma their nature. Shut the front door, Prowl! Kit thundered as she jumped as she jumped a treasure chest and continued to weave her way toward the smaller passageway. Yeah, Prowl! Rico darted behind Rico darted behind a gold statue to avoid a dragon, which cut straight through the thing with one of its claws. Now is not the time to point fingers. Oh, would you rather review your stupidity in a post battle tactics discussion? Prowl yelled. Kit glanced back and saw the gold dragon unfurl its wings, revealing five pony-sized mini-dragons that zoomed around it. Great! We've got a mini-boss on deck! Uh, Gil is... Do you want us to come help? Gil asked over the party chat. A dragon mini-boss! I bet it has amazing drops! Axel enthusiastically added. Uh... No! No! Rico shouted. In fact, get out of the cavern! We're coming in hot! Kit said. I'm in the passageway! Cookie reported. Keep running! Kit said. Don't stop until you're out of the treasure chamber! When the gold dragon reared back and its throat and mouth started to glow with white-hot flames, Kit was inspired to new speeds and zipped under the belly of the green dragon, which stood between her and the tunnel. She was trying... Okay... Let me, 
That was the bad inflection. That was, that was bad inflection. Blah. When the gold dragon reared back and its throat and mouth started to glow with white-hot flames, Kit was inspired to new speeds and zipped under the belly of the and zipped under the belly of the green dragon, which stood between her and the tunnel. She was trying to hustle around its clawed paws without getting herself impaled when, trump when trumpets sounded, sparks fizzled around her, and a pop-up window loaded in front of her face, blocking her view. Congratulations! You have learned the life skill. Cowardly leader. Due to... You have learned the life skill. Cowardly leader. Due to your cowardly ways... You have learned how to flee faster. Skill effect. If you are leading a party, all party members receive a speed boost when fleeing engaged enemies. Passive skill. Worst timing ever, Kit shouted as she tried to dismiss the screen. Oh, Kit, did you just get a new skill? That is a nice speed boost, Cookie said. Uh, Vic is... Yeah, but what's the name again? Vic asked. Kit didn't answer and concentrated on hustling the remaining distance to the smaller cave. Why does everybody in this party turn into a peanut gallery in the most dangerous moments? I'm in the hallway, Rico said. Me too. Prowl said. The ground shook again when the gold dragon heaved its head down, flames crackling in its mouth. Yikes! Kit yipped as she made it into the passageway and turned the corner just before the dragon spat out its fire. Flames exploded just outside the passageway, opening and shattered... Flames exploded just outside the passageway opening and shattered several of the crystals that dotted the walls with its heat. Kit, are you okay? Rico asked. Yeah, I'm fine. Is everyone out? Gil, Axel, and I are out in the main hallway, Vic said. There was a pause. Then Cookie added, Exiting the treasure chamber now. Kit followed the passageway as it snaked, making a sharp 90-degree turn. The angle let her see back into the large cavern, where two dragons slithered into the passageway after her. Two dragons are following me in, she announced. After she turned the corner, she could see Rico running just ahead of her, her blue robes streaming behind her like a puffy cloud. I'm just behind you, Rico. Great! Wait, no. Sorry. I'm just behind you, Rico. Great! We're almost there. The dragons that had followed Re Kit into the tunnel picked up their speed. One of them was the white dragon, which spat another ball of lightning at Kit. Incoming! Kit shouted. She dropped to the ground so the lightning sailed harmlessly over her head. As soon as it passed, she leaped to her feet and, sprint and sprinted down the tunnel. Encouraged by the sight, as soon as it passed, she leaped to her feet and sprinted down the tunnel, encouraged by the sight of the treasure chamber entrance. Bah! One more time. As soon as it passed, she leaped to her feet and sprinted down the tunnel, encouraged by the sight of the treasure chamber entrance. Treasure chamber entrance. I think that's right. Um. Look out, Prowl! Rico darted to the side, also avoiding the lightning. I see it! The saboteur spun around to face the attack and threw some kind of powder at it. The lightning froze for a moment, then sizzled and exploded with a deafening thunder. What was that? Axel stuck his head into the treasure chamber, his red hair and man buns stick making him stick out like a sore thumb. I said stay out! Kit roared as the other dragon, the red one, closed in on her. Axel sucked his head back out of the room like a mouse retreating to its hole. Jeez, you don't have to be so cranky about it! The red dragon lunged forward, its jaws gaping open, and barely missed snapping Kit up in its mouth. I have two rampaging dragons who are close enough behind me to snap my neck. I'll be crabby if I want, she shouted as she started running in serpentines. Or serpentine? Serpentines or serpentines? Glub, glub. There is a glab reading. There is a glab reading. You'll see. Oh. What's up, Salty Noah? Okay. 
I'm out, Prowl announced. Me too, Rico added after a moment or two. Kit tried to put on another burst of speed as she aimed for the small, dark entryway. She heard the white dragon inhale deeply, then spit out another ball of lightning. If I try to avoid it, the red dragon will be on me in an instant. I'll just have to gun it. Her heart hammering in her throat, Kit sprinted for the entryway. The lightning crackled just behind her, bearing down on her like a missile. She threw herself forward and flew through the small entryway, barely avoiding getting struck by the attack. She rolled into the main passageway, flying head over heels, and smacked into a boulder parked in the middle of the path. Sorry, guys. And smacked into a boulder parked in the middle of the path. I hate dragons, she said. A trumpet sounded. Congratulations. Your life skill, cowardly leader, has risen to level two. <laughs> All right, so that was good. I like that. Uh, nice energy to it. Very well written. I mean, there are a few sentences that kind of ran long, but that's all right. It's It still sounds good. Uh, oh, that's right. It's German, not giant. Dude, I'm totally doing a German sp invading butt raptor. Uh, sorry. Uh, didn't mean to bring butt raptors into my discussion of your book. <clears throat> A.M. Soma. Uh, actually, I think she's K.M. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if that's supposed to be something we share. But uh, thanks for the request, A.M. Soma. Uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. It looks like you have two books out in this series. Um, so go check it out, guys. It's on Kindle. It's doing pretty well. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, sh I'm sure she has some other stuff under a different name, but I, I, I don't want to give any of that stuff away. Um, but anyway... So, yeah, this is available on Kindle, so go check it out. Uh, and, yeah, that's, I think that's all I got. So, next book. Um, I did a little bit of research on this one. It looks kind of like a... It looks more like um, Dark Souls or Demon Souls or whatever uh, as, an, as a lit RPG, uh, which is interesting. So... I'm I'm pre I'm kind of excited to do this one, I, and I was excited when I saw it come up on the request page, but it just never got voted in until this time, and it was neck and neck with another cringe theater. So I'm th so I'm thank I'm very very thankful that this one made it. Um, here we go. All right, so we got some character direction again, which I'm very happy about. Do we have? Is uh. Bellart right here in the, uh, is, is, did, did you tag him in the, in the share, share thingy, Danny? Um, I'm, I'm hoping he's, he's here, because he's been waiting to have his book read on here for so long. Um, but anyway, here we go. Let's, let's look at his character direction here. All right, so Sam Nagai, age 27, real appearance. Five foot eight, two hundred, five foot eight, two hundred eighty-ish, fat Japanese. Virtual appearance: six foot five, two hundred eighty-ish, muscle, black. Personality: a prototypical gamer. Sam has a foul mouth and likes crass humor. He can be quite loud, quite loud and disrespectful with his sarcastic humor. In the heat of the moment, he often gets frustrated. He also has a kind and gentle side that he often shares and has the capacity to pause and assess a situation before jumping into it. He is the smart and cal he is smart and calculating when it's time for business. You know what's funny? It sounds like what I would be like playing Dark Souls. Just a, a lot of fuck. God damn it. That that that's what that game's all about. Just cussing at your TV and your controller. Okay, uh, voice. Young American gamer. Cali dialect, I guess. I haven't given much thought of, to if he sounds different inside the game. His avatar is six foot five and black, but in my head his voice was always the same. If you wanted to play around with that, it'd be funny at the very least with some of the dialogue I gave him. I'll try it. I'll see what I can do. Alex Madura. The thing is, if you, do, if you change the voice and don't discuss it, then it kind of wouldn't work in audiobook format. But I'll do it just for the show, because it's funny. Alex Madura, age 28, appearance, average height, average weight, Hispanic, personality, kind, caring, sarcastic humor, fl flirtatious, voice, an average girl, maybe with some light Cali dialect, all right? The singing creature, unfortunately there is a creature that sings in this chapter, not sure how you want to handle it, 
I don't write out what the creature is singing, so if you wanted to add some atmosphere to it, any creepy song you can think of will suffice. All right. I don't... Later, Daniel. Um, all right, so here we go. Hell's Glitch. All right, looks like he's starting me on chapter four. Come on, please. I keep forgetting to look for a better app to read these PDFs through. All right, Hell's Glitch by Bellart Wright. Four. Hard ass. Sam's point of view, Sam's viewpoint, went from... Sam's viewpoint went from looking directly at his character, Sarum, to swiveling around to the back of him, then traveling inside his head until Sarum and Sam were one. Until Sarum and Sam were one. It was like Sam had predicted. The simulation was a first-person one. Sam looked down at his digital hands and noticed that he was moving them. It was initially a weird sensation, like he had never had hands before in his life. The ones he was looking at weren't his. Well, now they were. He flexed his long, dark fingers and heard the crunch of the supple leather when he ba balled his hand into a tight fist. Nope. The leather felt good, and so did the wind. A nice breeze was blowing on a relatively quiet night. There were no man-made sounds to be heard, only the sounds of tiny forest creatures. There were actually tiny spiders and crickets moving around on the forest floor, seemingly alive in a nightly dance just like in real life. This is sick, Sam whispered to himself. He couldn't believe that such minute details were, re were rendered inside of the game. It was almost indistinguishable from a real forest. He looked above, and though the trees could see some of the moon's... and through the trees could see some of the moon's radiant glow. He wanted to see more, so he moved his feet for the first time. It was another funny sensation... A strange tingling traveled through his whole body. He moved to the middle of the clearing to look up at the gorgeous full moon. It was a much more beautiful sight than any moon he'd seen in real life. The hugeness of it, its purple tint, and the glow from it made it otherworldly, and its mere sight made Sam frightful, yet excited to the journey that was to come, yet excited for the journey that was to come. He let out a shaky breath in an effort to calm himself, and thought about his next plan of action. He wasn't just some mere player. He still had a job to do. He had to remember to think of this like work, like every other game he'd played instead, like every other game he'd play-tested. At the moment, that seemed impossible, but he had to get over it. He walked, he walked around in a circle to get accustomed to the walking. He stayed in the same area so as not to rouse any enemies that might be nearby, and talked to himself. My burrito is done, yes. So, my method is the same as always. I need to first find the bug. That requires extreme testing of the game's systems or one of its features. I'll need to even go outside the bounds of reason and explore every inch of the game that I can. I'll have to test it and repeat the test to make sure that it's a repeatable flaw. Either way, I'll report what I find to the developers. They'll check it out and let me know if they want me to test it further. Hopefully, I can do this quickly and move on, so I can get five glitches before anyone else. <laughs> Level up. Insta-kill! Um, okay. Sam was satisfied with this method. He prepared to check his gear when he heard a voice... He prepared to check his gear when he heard a voice that didn't fit with anything else he'd seen in this world so far. The liveliness of her voice broke his connect concentration and immersion with the world. That's a... What? Okay. That's a good method. That's a good method, tester number 41. Sam Nagai, is it? The woman sounded young 
maybe close to Sam's twenty-seven years as there was a hint of maturity in her tone. Who are you? Sam asked. Oh, sorry. I'm one of the level designers for this area, the Forest of Woe. Fun fact, it's also called the Assassin's Forest by many of the NPCs in Murderville. Oh, it's also called the Assassin's Forest by many of the NPCs and Murderville by many of us on the design team. My name is Alex Madeira, she said, joviality in her tone. Nice to meet you, Alex. So this is a planes game? The character creation and even the name of this area makes me think it is. Is it a sequel or a, me or a remake? He asked. Sorry, Sam. At this stage of the game, I'm not authorized to answer those kinds of questions. Well, that's a bummer. But it's kind of obvious that this is that same sort of game. There's no harm in you making whatever speculations you want, Sam. I just can't confirm or deny them. Oh. There's no harm in you making whatever speculations you want, Sam. I just can't confirm or deny them, she said playfully. Fair enough, Alex. I take it uh, I take it I'll report whatever glitches I find to you? Yes, and I apologize for taking you out of the game's atmosphere like this, but we do so early but we do so early on to remind testers of their roles. As you can see, it's easy to get lost in the game world and forget why you're even here. <laughs> oh, Sam chuckled at the obvious truth of that. <laughs> You guys definitely know your game. Well, thanks for the reminder. No need to thank me, Sam. I know you already realized your goal before I contacted you. I heard you speak your plans for testing out loud. I'm only interrupting now to tell you my part in all this. I think it helps we are on the same page as early as possible. It'll make the rest of our communications go a lot smoother. The woman had really good reasoning. So Sam was all ears. So, what's your part? He asked. Okay, so I'll take it a step back and go over one of the parts of your own testing method. You actually don't have to repeat in you actually don't have to repeat any bugs you find yourself. Just report them as soon as you find them. I'll take a look at the code, and if I think that it needs further testing, I'll let you know. And don't worry, I'm a fast code reader. If anything needs repeating, I'll know almost instantly. That was really good. Sam counted his blessings that he got a designer as efficient as Alex to report his bugs to. Seems this contest had a great element of luck involved, too, since you didn't know which designer you'd have helping you. Sam was sure that not all of them would be as good as this Alex seemed to be. Glad I got you then, Alex. Is there anything else? Well, I'm getting to it, Sam. Sam chuckled again and fiddled through his various menu options. <laughs> Sorry. Please continue, Alex. There's an extra menu just for you testers. It's called Alpha Build. Sam was already browsing through it. What I... What I need you to report to me is listed under Reports. What's needed is self-explanatory. After you send me a report and I check the data, I run simulations myself. If I can't find the bugs on my own with the data you gave me, then I'll have you repeat it in your build of the game. If we successfully repeat it on either end, on either my end or your end, we'll officially list it as a game bug. With this current test, we won't focus on fixing any of the bugs. We just want to discover them at this point. So find as many as you can. Sam smiled broadly. He couldn't have asked for a better system. He'd now be able to find a bug, report it, and simply move on instead of being stuck trying to help the developers fix it. This job would be fun after all. That's the plan, Alex. Glad we're on the same page now. We definitely want the same thing, Sam. To make this game the best it can be and to make sure you win this contest. You can count on me. Good luck. The option to contact her was under Reports on the Alpha Build menu. The first level menu options were Inventory, Equipment, Status, Game Options, Alpha Build. Sam selected his inventory to see the other items he came with besides his gear. The menu dropped down in front of him with images of his items on a two-dimensional grid. There was more here than was listed. There was more here than was listed in the character creation. He already had a healing item called a soul fire that could be used five times before emptying. The portrait of the somewhat translucent silver container made it look like bottled blue fire. It even danced with life as Sam stared at it. He read its description. Soulfire. Heals HP. 
a mystical silver container able to hold the coveted essence of human determination and will, has a restorative effect on those heavily afflicted with the phoenix's curse. Only those chosen few will find themselves in possession of the... Only those chosen few will find themselves in possession of this item. Along with that, he had some rings that increased his resistances. One increased his resistance... One increased his resistance to physical damage, and the other increased his resistance to magic. He laughed at the names of each ring. Excuse me. Beginner's Gift of Survival Increases Physical Defenses A Starting Gift for Our First Adventurous A Starting Gift for Our First Adventurous Full Divers Don't say we here at Full Core have never done anything for you. Winking Happy Face Beginner's Gift of Persistence Increases Mystical Defenses A Starting Gift for Our First Adventurous Full Divers Do Your Best to, do your best to Get Accustomed to the Game Never give up. Oh, wow. They still made this easy mode for me. That didn't stop him from using the rings. He backed... He backed out of the inventory and equipped the rings right away through the equipment menu. His weak defensive stats rose up to levels rivaling the other classes. He wondered if the other classes received the rings as well, but thought, but thought there wouldn't be a point in that. Maybe this character stole these items or something. He tried to resume. He tried to reason. He checked the manual to read up on the basics before he did anything else. Even the basics of the man manual clocked in at over a hundred pages. The extra motions players could do in VR added a lot more complexity to the game. There were now special techniques that the character could perform if Sam could mimic the right motions, with Sam's horrid level of bodily coordination, he counted that as a current impossibility and stuck to the most basic style of play. I can't read all this. I'll just have to learn as I go. He hurriedly crammed some info about blocking, parrying, roll dodging, and attacking. He thought he understood the gist of it all, so he closed his menu. He didn't want anyone beating him to that bonus, so he did what any good adventurer would do and put one foot in front of the other. The clearing provided a... Cl Maybe I need to move this over. The clearing provided a... Cl the clearing provided a clear trail forward. Sam hoped it was the right direction. There didn't seem to be much but darkness in the other direction. The dark forest was spread out around him, obscuring all that was within as long as he stood in the moon's light. He wondered if his eyes would adjust to the dark, like in real life. He needed to be ready for whatever was inside. He didn't recognize this part of the game. Well, he did sort of recognize it, but he wasn't supposed to be here so early in the game. In the original Death Plains game, you started off in a graveyard, so this wasn't a remake after all. Maybe it was a sequel then. Excuse me. The clearing's path led back into the dark forest, but there didn't seem to be no anywhere else to go, so Sam proceeded further in. Wait, is my dagger even equipped? <clears throat> he didn't have anything in his hands, and he saw nothing at his sides, not even a scabbard. So he checked his equipment menu and found nothing equipped to either hand slot. Trolls! He yelled in anger. See ya! Thanks for coming and hanging out. He was mad that he didn't notice it earlier when he was putting on the rings. He quickly equipped his dagger to his right hand and the deflector shield to his left. A scabbard for the dagger appeared on his lower back and his deflector was always strapped to his left wrist as long as it was equipped. There was a slot for another weapon or shield on either hand slot, making for a maximum of two slots to each hand. You couldn't equip all four weapons or shields at the same time, but could switch between two of them in each hand on the fly. He made sure he had all his armor on as well. After confirming that all his equipment was in its proper place, he figured he was ready for combat. The only issue he had was that his tiny deflector and naturally low defenses made blocking ineffective. Even with the extra protection from the ring, he'd be in a bad spot if he couldn't dodge properly. 
He also needed to be quick and parry with his deflector, so he wasn't totally defenseless. Why did I pick this class? I'm going to get killed so hard that my friends are going to throw me a funeral in real life, he said, only half-joking. He silently laughed at his own absurdity, mostly to calm his nerves. Then he proceeded forward and heard some footsteps other than his own. He stopped and hid behind a tree to see if he could find where the sound was coming from. His eyes were successfully adjusting to the dark, just not all the way yet. But the footsteps were growing louder. I hope they didn't see me. They had probably seen him while he was in the moonlit clearing, whoever or whatever it was. He frantically searched around for whoever was coming and found the silhouette behind him over his right-hand shoulder. The thing seemed to be walking deeper into the forest and paying him no attention. He was stuck at a, cross he was stuck at a crossroads wondering what to do next. The smart thing to do would be to keep going and avoid whatever that thing was. But that was also cowardly. He hadn't even seen what it looked like. He had to at least do that before he chickened out. He crept through the trees without making a sound. He had to look down at his feet to make sure he had them. The silent movement must have been a cutthroat class perk, or the silent movement must have been a cutthroat class perk, or maybe an ability that came from the equipment. He wasn't sure since he hadn't read any of the descriptions yet. He used the silence to his advantage, closely stalking the strange creature milling about through the forest. A sliver of moonlight peeked through a tiny opening in the canopy, and the thing walked right under it for a split second. Sam saw thin and dark brown wooden flesh. Sam saw thin and dark brown wooden flesh and elongated branch-like limbs. He only saw it from the back, where it was mostly covered in dark purple leaves. It was taller than most men, easily towering over Sam. Well, I've seen it now. Time to move on? The answer was no. Now that he saw it, he had to kill it. That was the law in these types of games. There was a chance that this thing could later sneak up on him while he was fighting some other creature, or it could even have some useful item that he or it could even have some useful item that he needed. It would definitely have souls to drop, this game's version of experience points. He equipped his dagger by grabbing it from its scabbard and stalked forward. The plant creature had stopped near a tree and seemed to be doing nothing. Sam, a.k.a. Serum the Sanguine, reached, inched forward a little bit. Then a little more. Then a little more. The tree he waited behind now was right next to the creature. He held his breath and peeked around it. Even peeked around at it. Even in the dark, he could see that its back was to him. His sight was pretty good, now that he was accustomed to the dark. He inched forward just a little more, then felt a shiver followed by a cold sweat. He stopped in his tracks immediately, knowing something was wrong. The plant creature raised its purple leafy head to the sky and shrieked. It was a dreadful sound, and Sam felt another wave of cold come over his body. The dreadful noise sounded like a whistle, a cry, and a scream at the same time, together carrying a foreboding melody. Sam had never heard anything like it. He slowly and quietly crouched and watched the surrounding forest for any signs of movement. Is this thing calling someone? Does it know I'm here? Is... is it singing? He was ready to run at a moment's notice, but the leafy thing was still staring up at the sky and there was no movement in the forest around them. Perhaps he'd found his first glitch. He didn't dare stop and report it now. He wanted to see what the creature would do next. It had transformed or... It hadn't transformed or anything, and its behavior seemed to remain the same. It didn't even seem to know he was there. Once it started moving, he moved with it. It seemed to be moving back to where he'd first heard its footsteps. Compared to Sam, the thing was a heavy stepper. It loudly crunched all manner of foliage underfoot as it passed its original location. When it stopped again... Sam made sure to get even closer. This time he was quick to look around for other approaching movements. He only made his move when he was certain he saw no other movement in the forest and his moves were quick, clean, and quiet. With three silent steps he was at the monster's back and with one swift motion he plunged his dagger deep into it. He felt the thing shiver and saw it wilt as the cold dagger pierced through wood and found its target. 
The thing had some kind of soft organs inside of it. Sam could feel whatever he had struck squirming around his blade. He instinctively kicked the creature off of his dagger and pulled the blade away as it fell to the ground. He had successfully gotten a special backstab on the creature, meaning he had effectively done at least triple his normal damage to it. His dagger and gloves were now covered in the beast's dark blue blood. After attacking it, he was able to see its health bar. He watched as it quickly diminished. Only it stopped diminishing a little more than halfway, and the creature started moving on the ground. Sam whispered his panic under his breath. Were you fucking kidding me? The critical blow had allegedly done three to four times normal damage, and it still only took down slightly more than half the creature's HP. Sam's class was ridiculously weak. Or maybe this enemy was just too strong. I can't believe this. Come on, get up! Let's go! Sam tried to position himself at the creature's back as it was rising, but the thing quickly turned to face him as if it knew his thoughts. He's quickly struck... He quickly struck it two times with a slash and a stab at its arms and chest, doing damage that was barely noticeable. The critical damage for the backstab must have been much higher than he'd anticipated, like twice as high. Now, his attacks didn't seem to be doing even a single percent damage to it. The thing lashed out at him with its pointed claws and he barely dodged it with an instinctive side roll. It was as if the game had assisted him with the maneuver. His movement was much smoother than anything he could muster in real life, and he noticed that he cleared a long distance. He was quickly on his feet and nearing the creature's back again. The rolling motion had made him feel a little dizzy, but he ignored that and tried to get in close. The creature extended its brown, leafy arms out at its sides, and they grew large wooden spikes that hardened to a darker brown. The creature then spun its upper body around in a deadly contortionist's twister, Sam was too close and reactively raised his deflector in a parrying motion. The panicked parry was way too early, and Sam, and Sam was left wide open to the creature's attack. The backhand blow was solid and sent Sam sprawling down onto his back. The pain felt too real. Sam could actually taste the blood in his mouth. It made him wonder what was happening to his real body as he played the game. It made him want to quit but there was an urge deep in the primal part of his brain that didn't want to die no matter no matter if he was in real no matter if he was in real reality or virtual reality it made him rise to his feet for his own survival the blow had taken a little over a third of his total health and the creature was approaching to attack again now on his feet sam knew what his next move would have to be with his current class he could only play in a reactionary way he'd have to capitalize on an enemy's mistakes and punish them for it now that this thing was guarding its back so well from his attacks, he only saw one good option, but he had to wait for a good chance to use it. Sam stood at a disadvantage. Sam stood at a disadvantageous. Sam stood at a disadvantage. Sam stood at a disadvantage. Sam stood at a disadvantageous middle range from the creature that he now decided to call hard ass. He stood straight ahead of it, prepared to dodge at a moment's notice. Hardass whipped its stretchy leaf-like arms and razor-sharp claws at Sam. Sam dodged, Sam dodged to the left, out of the creature's way. The move was, the move was guaranteed to put him at the creature's back again, but the creature's response felt off. Oh, crap. Screw you, hardass! That whipping motion had been a feint. Before Sam had even made it to his feet, hardass was priming for another attack, it stretched excuse me it stretched its thorny limbs all the way over to him one of the claws took on a spear-like shape and pierced his chest while the other struck him in the face cutting into much of his flesh and drawing blood it hurt like hell and even when it it hurt like hell and even when it recalled its limbs sam's body was left with a feverish feeling he had lost half of his he had lost half of his health this time, and now it was steadily decreasing even more. There was a constant buzzing sound in his ear, like some small object was dunked into acid nearby. That's when he noticed that his own that's when he noticed that his own health bar display in the upper left hand corner had the words poisoned over it in huge red letters. This his health bar itself was deep purple now. Great. I'm going to die in the first few minutes of this game. And the worst part of it was that he knew it would hurt more than any pain he felt before. All right, so I like the way I like the way he writes action scenes. 
Bellart, uh, Bellart Wright. Um, that, that was a pretty cool sample. Thanks for the request, Bellart. Uh, I hope you're here, and if you're not, I hope you watch the replay. I wonder what you, what everybody else thinks of it. Um, definitely reminds me of Dark Souls, but I don't know. Maybe if, maybe that's just because I already had that in my mind. But um, I'm pretty sure that I read something somewhere about the author purposefully giving you that impression because he's a Dark Souls fan. I, I I can appreciate the game. I can't. I don't know how you guys feel about Dark Souls, but how I feel is that the controls prevent me from enjoying it. I feel like it's clunky and uh, hard to hard to deal with. Um, but I like the concept. I like the uh, the difficulty. You know, all the um, the cur the cursing and yelling at the at the game. That's part of the, that's part of the joy. It's like a masochist's game. So. Yes, again, thank you, Bell Art. I hope you uh, request something else in the future. And it's time to get cringy. Uh, this is um, this is cringe theater, guys. This is Space Raptor Butt Invasion by Chuck Tingle. And yes, this is super NSFW. This is, please hide if you are sensitive in any way. This is exactly as crazy as it sounds like it's going to be. Um, I mean, I haven't read it at all, but I did send all the kids to bed. Yes, send them to bed. Put them away. Hide everyone. Um, only only the true, the true survivors, the truly hardcore people who love watching me embarrass myself should watch this. Because it's really... I mean, okay, so... I haven't read it, like I said, but... I have read Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt on this show. And that was brutal. Um, I don't know how much of this... Uh, okay, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read until I just can't. And that's what I did with, uh, with Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt. Um, it's like 30, the whole thing is like 39 pages. I guarantee you I'm not going to get to the end. Um, but yeah, if anyone knows Chuck Tingle, if anyone knows Chuck Tingle fans, go get them real quick. Get them to, get them to, uh, to, to watch this stream. And, um, I'm going to go get some more water. And Dave says I may need booze for this. I may as well. I think I'll just go ahead and get some. Um, yeah, three fingers of Jack. That's that's enough, probably. Maybe not. I don't know. I may. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I am probably gonna need booze. I'm gonna get some. I'm gonna get some something to drink. I'm gonna get some water. I'll be right back. Anyone who comes in here, they will see cringe theater. They will see space raptor butt invasion. Hopefully, they'll know what they're getting into. But I may need to like remind. I, here's the thing. I'm okay with doing this stuff, but. I don't know if it's professionally a good thing to do. <laughs> I've been thinking about that. Like, is this going to mess me up just doing this publicly? I mean, maybe it will. I don't know. But it, it, to me, it's like, it's so entertaining. It's entertaining to do with other people around, you know? And I need something to, to bring more people into this show. I don't know. You guys maybe need to discuss this on Facebook. Be right back, getting drinks. All right, I'm back. And one more warning. 
anyone who's here, be prepared for some some major secretly a perv. Oh, I'm not the one who requests this stuff. Is Michael Ryan Soylo secretly a perv? That's a better that's a better question. Um, anyone who's just coming in, first of all, I am giving out audiobooks. It seems kind of funny. Oh no, you're going to miss it? That's, I thought that's what everyone came here for. Uh, I am giving away free audiobooks, but I'm sure that's kind of hard to concentrate on because there's some crazy NSFW stuff coming. Anyone who's watching now, be warned. I may warn people again halfway through reading this because it's a stream people are going to just pop in you know hey what's going on here oh my god um maybe i'll leave the cringe theater thing up or maybe i'll i'll move it i think what i'll do is i'll move it move it to the top of my head there um Oh, you guys, you guys ready for this? Space Raptor Butt Invasion by Chuck Tingle. Be warned, cringe, cringe, cringe. This is very cringe. Wow. Cool, Shogun Lee has requested an audiobook. It should strobe. It should knee, 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 knee. That's what it should do. I wish I knew how to do that. Not a Chuck Tingle book, no. Okay, good. Okay, Truffle wants one. Shogun Lee wants one. I don't have any Chuck Tingle productions. Uh, this is, whoo, here goes. It's going to be a long year for you up here, my fellow astronaut, Officer Pike says. You think you're ready for it? Ready as I'll ever be, I tell him with a slight smile. I lean back in my chair and watch as Pike continue. I'm playing as this guy. If you didn't, if you didn't notice, this, hold on, this guy. This, I was, I'm very bad at this. This guy. I'm playing as that guy. I lean back in my chair and watch as Pike continues to pack his bags, preparing for his launch home that looms just a few hours away. Lucky bastard. Nothing can quite prepare you for the loneliness of space until you're actually here, floating in orbit on a giant rock as it circles some distant star. Pike knows this is, Pike knows this as well as I do. We were both stationed here on Zorbus two years ago. <laughs> Zorbus, okay. Taking over for two other astronauts who had just finished putting in their time. This would probably give me some sort of solace, knowing that Pike fully understood the feelings of loneliness that were already brewing up inside of me, but even given our shared experiences, he has no idea what's in store. This is because, up until today, all astronauts participating in the Earth Outpost program have had a partner with them at all times. In fact, some of the more active stations can have up to six humans inhabit inhabiting them at once. Now, Thanks to budget cuts, our tiny little station on Zorbus will have one single res resident for then... Now, thanks to the budget cuts, our tiny little station on Zorbus will have one single resident for then next year. Yours truly. This is not at all what I signed up for. But at this point, I'm not exactly... In, I'm not exactly in the position to argue. Just remember, Pike says with complete sincerity... You're up here doing a lot of good for the folks back down there on Earth. Try not to forget it. I let out a long sigh. I know, I know. Pike stops. I don't think you do. And I don't blame you. 
It's easy to get detached up here, Lance. <laughs> he totally looks like a Lance. <laughs> but you've got to focus on the, pos on the positives. Without us, Earth would have no hope of ever finding another home. I mean, how many years do we have left down there? Even with population control. Ten max, I tell him. This was the current scientific concurrence on Earth's lifespan. A dreadful thought. I know you're right. But what is it helping to have... It's a build-up, right? When do the space raptors get here? Butt raptors. I know you're right. But what is it helping to... But what is it, but what is it helping to have me just sit out here like this? We already know that... <laughs> We already know that there's not enough oxygen on this rock to sustain life. Pike smiles. But there could be. There is hope here, and you know that. I shake my head. I don't know, man. We've been terraforming this dust for five years, and we're no better off than we were when we started. I have an arm behind... I wave an arm behind me, motioning towards the massive glass window of the space station. The entire wall is translucent, showing off a truly breathtaking view of a hilly gray landscape beyond where two separate moons hang brilliantly in the dark sky. If I hadn't seen this view every morning for far longer than I'd care to remember, I might even be moved to tears by the sight, a real manifestation of mankind's commitment to science and space travel. Instead, I find myself bored, reminded that as a Reminded that as Pike is taking off his in his shuttle pod towards Earth, I'm going to be trekking back across the massive gray dunes to gather data from the terraforming station. <clears throat> you know it could be much worse, Pike offers. In Station 16 on Curlin, they don't have a gravity drive. I'm in shock. You mean they've just been floating around in there? Basically, Pike says. At least you get to pretend you're on Earth until you head outside. I suppose I'm looking for any assurance that I can get at this point, because somehow Pike's words actually make me feel a little better. I guess it's not that bad up here. You want to play one last game of ping pong before you go? I ask. We can turn the gravity low just like you like it. Pike cracks a wry grin. You're on! I begin to stand when suddenly I begin to stand when suddenly an announcement comes blaring over the space station's loudspeakers in that same mechanical voice that I've come to know and love. What kind of voice? Is it male or female? Shutting 5 Alpha has arrived. No, Shuttle 5 Alpha has arrived. Officer Pike is now dismissed. Pike shrugs. Guess I've got a roll. As Pike puts on his spacesuit, I join him figuring that I'll walk out to see him off and then continue on my way to the terraforming outpost. We suit up quicker than normal as, clearly, Pike can't wait to get off this fucking rock and then open the hatch door and step out into the dark, alien landscape. Well, well, I'll be seeing you soon, I guess. Officer Pike radios to me through his helmet, exchanging a hug in our bulky white spacesuits. Yeah, you will, I tell him. In one year, I'll buy you a beer back on Earth. Sounds like a plan, Pike says. Why isn't Pike buying him a beer? He was the one that has to stay in space. Shouldn't Pike be like, good job, here's a beer. Instead, Lance is like, I'm sorry I'm your bitch, here's a beer. The officer walks over to his shuttle pod and punches in a few numbers on the keypad, then steps back as the door lifts open. The dust is still settling from the ship's recent landing in his low-gravity air. Fly safe, I offer through the static of our spacesuit headsets. Pike nods and is about to close his shuttle door, but then stops, looking at me with a deathly seriousness. All joking aside, he says, don't think too hard out here. Stay light. I give Pike a strange look, not quite, not quite fully understanding what he means. 
Space can get a little strange, Pike tells me. People can start to see things. He trails off anyway. Anyway, just take care of yourself. I will, I say with a nod. Pike closes the shuttle door and then begins his countdown for launch, prompting me to step back away from the ship. Moments later, the entire thing starts to lift up into the air, propelled by its minor gravity drive, and before I know it, the shuttle is hurtling off through space so fast that I can barely see it. Suddenly, I am completely alone. Still haunted by Pike's final words, I begin to make my usual walk across the hills of space dust towards our perpetually worthless terraforming station. As much as I've gotten used to the sight of these alien vistas, I will admit that it still gets me a little giddy every time that I go for a walk in such a low-gravity environment. As I bound over the hills, I'll admit that a smile slowly begins to cross my face. It's only when I reach the top of the mount and look down the, the other side that I freeze in shock and fear. There before me, some hundred yards away, is the terraforming station, just as it should be. Beyond the station, however, is a, f <laughs> is a figure that's clad in a spacesuit quite similar to mine. The two of us seem to notice each other at it at almost exactly the same time, locked in a bizarre standoff before, suddenly, the other figure turns and climbs aboard its two-wheeled vehicle. <laughs> I keep looking at the cover. <laughs> the next thing I know, the space-suited figure is taking off into the distance, riding furiously down into an alien valley before disappearing from my sight. It all happens so quickly that I don't even have time to give chase, simply struck dumb as I reel with the significance of what just happened. Holy shit, is all that I can manage to say. As I continue towards the terraforming station, my head is swimming with kinds of... My head is swimming with kind of confusing thoughts. Was I already space crazy? Was I so upset by the thought of my impending loneliness that I'd created a fellow astronaut in my head? It's possible. Yet, as I arrive at the station and search the surrounding grounds, I find definite footprints and wheel tracks in the dust. Unfortunately, as the space winds, as the space winds begin to pick up, I quickly realize that I will not be able to follow them before they are swept away entirely. I quickly fulfill my duties at the outpost and then immediately head back towards the main station, wasting no time at all as I head inside and tear off my spacesuit. It's coming, guys. Whew. Computer, has Earth sent another astronaut to join me? I ask aloud. No, you will spend the next year alone the space station computer says, its mechanical voice echoing throughout the massive outpost. Are you sure? Because I could have sworn that I just saw someone out there at the terraforming unit, I continue. I am sure, <laughs> states the computer flatly. There are no records of any new arrivals at this station. I collapse onto the couch and look out at my tired and true view of the alien landscape, letting out a long sigh. Then who the fuck was out there tonight? I ask myself. I awaken to the sound of a loud knocking on the hatch door, and then sit upright in a frantic moment of confusion. So the space raptor knocked. Pike! I call out, glancing around as I tra try to get my bearings. I must have fallen asleep on the couch. It only takes me a few seconds to remember that Pike is no longer here with me and a stab of fear comes shooting through my heart. If not Pike knocking on the door, then who is it? Cautiously, I stand up and walk over to the hatch, wondering now if the sound was nothing more than my paranoid mind playing tricks on me. The knocking comes again, and I jump. Hello? I call out. Three more knocks. My curiosity getting the best of me, I press a few buttons on the keypad to open the external hatch. Fortunately, 
There is a camera set up right inside the holding area, and I gasp aloud as I see that same spacesuit-wearing figure enter the chamber. Hello? I say into the microphone next to me as the external door closes behind the astronaut. Who are you? Who are you? Comes a voice from beneath the helmet. Lance Tanner of the Earth Outpost Program, I offer. Earth? Asks the voice from inside the spacesuit. Yes, I tell him. The, the voice starts to laugh, quietly at first, and then in a loud, jovial tone. <laughs> he should talk, says the astronaut. May I come in? I'm not exactly sure what the right call is here, but I can't just have this strange spaceman standing in my hatch all day, and I'm more than a little anxious to get to the bottom of all this. I sigh, and then reluctantly open the inside hatch door. Suddenly, I'm standing face to face with the unknown spaceman. L Lance, nice to meet you, I say, extending my hand. The figure extends a gloved hand as well, which I immediately notice has only three fingers. I'm Orion, the figure responds, and likewise, likewise. No, it'd still be W. Likewise. There's a loud hiss as the window of his helmet slides upwards, and I gasp aloud, recoiling in shock. There beneath the tinted glass is the smiling face of a voracious velociraptor, one of the most feared dinosaurs to ever roam the earth. But you're... you're a... I stammer. A dinosaur? asks the beast. Yes. I feel faint suddenly completely convinced that I'm suffering from some kind of severe space delusion. But that makes no sense, I say. I agree, says the raptor. I was told that this planet was entirely uninhabited. Who told you that? I ask, shocked. The raptor scientists back on Earth, too. The prehistoric beast responds flatly. This is too much to take in all at once. My head throbbing with anxiety, I step backwards and then have a seat on the couch once again. This can't be real, I start to repeat over and over again. This can't be real. This can't be real. I can assure you that I am very real, says Orion. Then what the fuck are you talking about? I shout, finally losing it. What is Earth too? The raptor astronaut nods in understanding. Ah, yes. I can see where the confusion could come from. I'm assuming that back on Earth-1, you were taught that my people died in some kind of ice age? Something like that? I nod. The dinosaur chuckles. <laughs> That's some revisionist history for you. No, there was no ice age. The real reason that the dinosaurs aren't around anymore is because we all left in search of a larger and more forgiving planet than Earth-1. We sailed the stars for many years until finding a suitable home on Earth-2. But we still like to keep tabs on all parts of the galaxy. Is this that what you're doing here? I ask. The dinosaur nods. Yep all alone in an empty solar system. As Orion says this, I detect a deep sadness behind his eyes, something that I can relate with all too well. Well, I start, not exactly sure where I'm headed. I mean, we're both up here together. I can't see why we can't hang out a bit. <laughs> I see a faint glimmer of hope behind Orion's dinosaur expression. Yeah? He asks. Sure. 
you play ping pong? <laughs> Over the next few days, Orion continues to come by the station and hang out. The two of us are an incredible duo, talking for, <laughs> talking for hours on end about our experiences in space or trading nostalgic stories about our home worlds. Despite being a bloodthirsty dinosaur carnivore, Orion is actually incredibly sweet and has a truly gentle soul. The longer that we spend together, the more I find myself drawn to him. Attracted, even. Our difference in species surely couldn't classify me as gay, could it? As the days turn into weeks, and weeks and weeks into months, I begin to wonder if I'd even care. Finally, after a long night of ping-pong and chowing down on astronaut ice cream, <laughs> me and Orion find ourselves lounging on the couch and looking out over the gray hills together. Can I ask you a personal question? I start, watching the dinosaur from the corner of my eye. Orion smiles. Sure thing, Lance. Shoot. You ever think about what it would be like to fuck a human? <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I ask. My heart is now thumping ferociously in my chest, but I try to remain calm and even keeled. Yeah, I mean, who hasn't? Orion offers. The thing is, I'm a pretty big dinosaur, and human women are just too delicate. I would probably crush one if I tried. I let his words linger in the air for a moment. Not sure if I should say what I so desperately want to. But it's now or never, I think to myself, taking a dr deep breath. What about a human man? I question. I can see the raptor's expression suddenly change as understanding washes over him. Yeah. I think I might be into that, actually. Sorry, that's not, that's French. That's t totally fucked that up. This is a German dinosaur, not a French dinosaur. Need to be a professional about this. Yeah, I think I might be into that, actually. Orion tells me. I mean, it's not gay if it's a dude raptor and a dude human, right? I ask. Totally not gay, says the dinosaur. The raptor would have to be in control, though. Dominating, even. Yeah, I sigh. <laughs> my cock rock hard in my pants. There's a moment of silence. Get down on your knees, the raptor suddenly commands. Seizing the moment, I follow his instructions. Slipping off of the couch and crawling onto my hands and knees in front of him. I sit with my head at the level of Orion's lap and look up with my big brown eyes. Unzip me. Orion instructs. I'm shaking as I slowly reach up and pull down the zipper of his space pants. <laughs> Where a massive red dino cock is just waiting to be unleashed from its fabric prison. Take it out. Orion demands, you need to be punished for being such a filthy little human. I am a filthy little human, I repeat coyly, then pull down the waistband of his space briefs and remove Orion's enormous raptor rod. I grip it tightly and then start to pump my firm grip up and down over its length. Orion leans back into his chair, reeling from the incredible sensation of my touch, 
I start slowly at first and then gain speed until I find a pleasant rhythm, using both hands to fully service his huge, scaly cock. Do you like that? I ask. How does it feel to punish your astronaut human sex toy? Oh, my God. That's so amazing! Orion moans, placing his claws around the back of my head and pulling me closer to him. Now, let me punish that pretty gay mouth of yours. I open wide as Orion guides me over the end of his shaft, pushing pushing deep into my mouth as I wrap my lips tightly around the girth of his dick. He keeps forcing me deeper and deeper until finally his swollen cock hits the back of my gag reflex and I retch loudly, pulling back and releasing his member from my throat. I cough and sputter a bit, trying to collect myself as salty tears stream down my face. You're gonna take that dinosaur dick and you're gonna like it, Orion tells me, taking me by the head and thrusting me down again. You should have known better than to test me. My people have been fucking for billions of years before you humans were even were... You humans were even around. This time I'm ready for his length, however, and as the head of his cock hits my gag reflex, I somehow manage to relax enough to let him pass. Now without a limit to his dominating deep throat, Orion pushes me down until my head is pressed deep into his lap, my eyes and nose forced up against his rock-hard reptile abs. <laughs> Orion holds me here for a moment, enjoying the sensation of being entirely consumed within my throat, and then finally pulls me back and begins to pump my head up and down over his shaft. When Orion finally lets me up for air, sorry, I thought, I forgot, I was supposed to warn people. <laughs> One more time before the action really started. This is cringe theater, everyone. I know this is a late warning, but warning... Yeah, it's probably going to get worse, so I might as well. This is awful. Okay. When Orion finally lets me up for air, I take a massive gasp and then climb up to kiss him deeply on the mouth. I reach down between my legs and grab his now slippery dick in my hand, beating it rapidly while using the leftover spit from my mouth as lube. Oh my god. Oh shit. Oh my god, this is so fucked up. <laughs> Pound me like the homo space boy that I am, I beg. Orion smiles as I say this, then reaches up and pulls my shirt off over my head. My space pants and underwear come down over next, completely exposing myself to the raptor. Do you want to fuck me? I ask. Suddenly... Orion stands up from the couch and grabs me by the arms, spinning me around and tossing me down onto the cushion in his place. I'm the one. I'm the one that, de I'm the one that decides who gets fucked around here, he says, slapping me hard on the ass. <laughs> oh my god, this is the most ridiculous shit in the world. Oh my god. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm leaned over the couch now, facing away from him with my muscular gay butt popped out in the air as Orion saddles up behind me and begins to align his member with my puckered asshole. Seconds later, Orion is pushing forward into me, testing the limits of my aching tightness. <laughs> oh my god, this is so fucked up. I let out a long moan of pleasure as he fills me up, gripping hard onto the back of the chair in front of me. Oh, fuck! You're the best dinosaur butt a guy could ask for! I whimper. Discipline me! I need it! Orion starts to... Oh, man, this is awful! Oh, this is the worst. Orion starts to push in and out of me. It's like I have to, like burst in to even attempt this shit anymore. Orion starts to push in and out of me, slowly at first and the gaining speed with each successive swoop until finally he's pounding into me at a steady pace, shaking the couch beneath me with every slam against my ass. 
I reach back with both hands and spread myself open for him so that he can get a good look at the toned young body he's railing. Ah! I hope he ends up pregnant. Whew, this is fucked up. Okay, I think I might be able to do like two more paragraphs, but I'm running out of energy here. Do you, do you like what I Do you like what you see? I ask playfully. <laughs> <laughs> so, like a, I mean, this guy's a gimp, come on. I ask playfully, looking back over my shoulder at the strong, ancient beast as he rams me. Orion reaches forward and grabs me by the base of my hair with his claw, pulling me back towards him as he continues to rail me from behind. Take this dick and shut your mouth, he, con <laughs> he commands. The dinosaur is dishing out the punishment here, so that humans don't get to ask questions. Yes, sir. I answer meekly. What the fuck was that? Orion counters. Yes, sir! I say a little louder. Good! Orion tells me. He's pounding me as hard as he can now, the force of our fucking literally scooting the couch across the space station floor. All right, that's all I got, guys. That's all I can do. Oh, my God. He's obviously going to get pregnant after this. Ooh. Oh, man. That's all I can do. Uh, good call on the German. I totally forgot about that. Uh, German lizard audiobook. Wow. Chuck Tingle. It's like a mind fuck. It's like a space raptor mind invasion. I'm never, I'm like, this is, I'm scarred for life. This is second scar for life. Chuck Tingle is uh, glab for the win. Yep. You're a twisted fucker, man. Um, kudos to you for writing these books. <laughs> bah! I kind of want to barf. I kind of want <laughs> Dr. Chuck Tingle, yes. Sorry. Uh, whoo. Whoo. Bah. I'm sure Amazon totally thinks I'm gay by now, though. Because this is the second... Chuck Tingle book that I've, excuse me, the, the second Chuck Tingle book that I've gotten through Kindle Unlimited. <laughs> oh man. So that was Chuck Tingle, everybody. Space Raptor, <laughs> butt invasion. I need to wash my brain out with soap. That was fucked up. Um, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you enjoyed all the requests. Uh, I hope it, that that read was worth it. Because if no one was watching, then I just embarrassed myself to no one, which is probably worse. Right? Probably, probably worse. If I, if there was no... <laughs> oh, man. I like how, as soon as he suggested it, the rapper's like, Yes! I could rape him in the butt! Like, that's what he was after in the first place. I'm sure it was. I mean, what else would a raptor want from a human besides to ram them in the butt? I agree. Someone should send Chuck Tingle the link, because... I mean, at least so that I can get a cease and desist letter from him and, like, print it out and hang it on my wall. You know, I, we weren't, no one was able to get a hold of him. He's got a Twitter, and that's all I know. Like, no one in the, as far as I know, no one in the publishing industry even knows who he is. It could be a female, for all, for all we know, you know. Oh, my God. So, with that in mind, okay... Can you guys remind me who requested books? Truffle, um, Ian, and Shogun. I would, you know, it would have been more realistic if he asked for a cup of sugar. I think. So I think that's a legitimate criticism of the novel. <clears throat> Uh, 
Did anyone else request a free audiobook, though? Just real quick. When does Life Reset come out? Well, it just got approved by um, Spoken Realms today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and get rid of this, <laughs> this cover. I'm sick of hanging out next to that guy. Um, it's uh, Yeah, it just got approved today through Spoken Realms. Spoken Realms is the intermediary between Sound Booth Theater and ACX because Shemmer Kuznets is living in Israel and ACX doesn't serve Israel so we have to go through us we have to go through a third party Spoken Realms is owned by Stephen J. Cohen by the way um, who's a, a great narrator great audio technician he's just a great guy he's so he's so open and easy to talk to he always wants to share information really good guy Stephen J. Cohen um, happy to bring some business his way uh, but uh, so Spoken Realms just approved it today, and they're going to be, I don't know what their process is exactly, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say that Life Reset is going to be available in two and a half weeks. Let's say that. Two and a half to three, somewhere between there. Because ACX takes however long they take. I mean, it's, it's kind of random nowadays, but, uh, it will be out soon. And please, people, buy that one up. Because, number one, it's good. It's really good. Uh, especially, like, especially, I did say but again, I'm sorry. There's too many butts in this stream. Especially for pure lit RPG nuts, like, Life Reset is, is a concentrated dose of lit, it's as lit RPG as anything could possibly be, Life Reset. Um, crafting, uh, town building, leveling up, monsters everywhere, abilities, goblins everywhere. I mean, yeah, yes, Stephen J. Cohen, good guy, sin. Um, but uh, yeah, so that yeah, that's why we had to go through them because I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have bothered. There's no, I mean, there's no reason. To, to go through anyone else besides ACX right now. So that's when the three weeks, you guys are going to love Life Reset. Uh, if you haven't read it already, the audio is a lot of, was, is pro, I don't know, I, I think you guys are going to like it because it's, um, I, I'd say it's even more lit RPG than Unbound Death Lord. Like, it's that same, it's even long, it's 24 and a half, this is the longest audiobook I've ever produced, 24 and a half hours long. So, it's huge, it's going to be worth your money, guaranteed. I mean, yeah, it's it's super good. So, anyway, watch out for that when it comes out. Um, thanks guys for coming and hanging out. I didn't, I'm not exactly sure, all the people, I think we got three requests, Shogun Lee, Ian Mitchell... And, uh, <laughs> sorry, my brain is destroyed from that read. Ian Mitchell, Shogun Lee, and Truffle are the three people that I can remember that requested. Um, so if there is no one else, I'm going to go ahead and log off here. I mean, I'll give you guys like 20 more seconds to respond if someone else, if someone else requested and I'm missing somebody. Dave, I mean, Dave's been here the whole time. Dave Wilmarth, did he want something? Not seeing anything. Oh, me too, Salty. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I'm not sure who you are, Salty. So, possibly. No other requests? Okay. No, oh, Enigmas Online. Yes, yes. Gotcha. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to get off here. So, thanks for hanging out. Uh, and giving me an opportunity to embarrass the fuck out of myself. 
And uh, yeah, I hope you guys will share this when it's uh, when it's ready on YouTube and everything, or even the the Twitch. Where it doesn't matter. Wow. Wow. I can't wait to start recording a different audio.